we have a triple threat of solar storms that are headed toward Earth. And one big flare player leaves while another one enters. Those stories and more are in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.edu slash SWEN. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week is picking up in a big way. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, never mind that cruciform scan right there, we've been actually dealing with some fast solar wind from this coronal hole. It's actually part of a coronal hole that's kind of rotated to the sun's far side. And that fast wind has brought aurora down to mid-latitudes kind of sporadically over this past week, really. And it's been a good show, but things are definitely calming down. Now, on top of that, we've been dealing with some big flares from regions 4055 and 4058, mainly uh, a few solar storms too, but they've been mainly going to the west of Earth. But these regions, thankfully, are now rotating to the sun's west limb. And these that means that the noise on the day side bands is going to calm down a bit for you amateur radio operators. But we do have some new regions rotating into Earth view, and we'll be talking about those in a minute. Meanwhile, what also has taken center stage are these two filaments right here. And as we get to the 12th, you can see they're rotating into the Earth strike zone. This one right here, look down here at this very bottom of this, about midday on the 12th, you can watch it lift off. Watch it whoosh right there. That was a nice gentle eruption. Not a lot going on there, but it destabilized this region right here. And watch it just a few hours later, it goes whoosh. And that destabilizes this part of the filament. So this one then just a, a short time later also takes off. Look at that. So we have one, two, three. There are three different solar storm launches here. As we take a look in coronagraphs, you can see that first one is actually a partial halo. That means that that first launch, even though it looks like it's going south of Earth, there is a partially Earthward directed component. And then as the next two launch, you can see them here in coronagraphs. Again, you've got a bit of a structure here and a bit of a structure here and even a little bit of a lip that goes out like this. This is a reasonably dense composite structure because you can see it even clear out in here. And that's the rest of this this junk kind of coming toward Earth. So we have kind of a one, two, three punch, a little triple threat that's coming out. Plus, we've got a coronal hole right here. And if you can see it, kind of a coronal hole right here. That means we've got fast solar wind on either side that'll kind of channel these structures to maintain their, their uh, trajectory right toward Earth. So we definitely are going to be getting hit by these structures as time goes on here. On top of that, as we continue looking at this coronal hole, this is part of that big structure that gave us a, some decent storming about a month ago. And now it's coming, rotating back into Earth view. You can even see with the fringe here, and then you can see the fringe down here in the corona. But look, no fringe here. That means this corona hole is still quite big and we haven't even seen the full thing rotate into Earth view. So Aurora photographers, man, this is a good week for you guys. You're gonna get a good show with these uh, triple threat of solar storms and then wait a little bit and you're gonna get some fast solar wind from this thing probably next week or so. We even have a small coronal hole here, probably not gonna give us all that much, but it might give us a little bit of an extended show. And we'll talk more about those solar storms as we move uh, into the five days. Also, on top of that, check this out. This is a pretty active region right in here. Look at it spitting fire and everything. So this is the big flare player that's going to be rotating into Earth view, and it's a new one. And we'll talk about that more in just a minute. Now, as we switch to our sun's far side, we're taking a look at Stereo A imagery because Stereo A has now finally moved kind of to the side of Earth. As you can see, here's Earth 
Here's the sun, and here's stereo A looking at the sun kind of from the side. And as we take a look at that, you can see regions 4055 and 4058. That might get you oriented. Plus, you can see that big coronal hole. This is the part that I said is already rotated to the sun's far side. So stereo really is seeing a good portion of the sun's far side. Plus, take a look at region 4049. This region actually has been firing some big solar flares and some solar storming. So this thing has actually gotten more active on the sun's far side, and we're going to be expecting some interesting stuff from it. Plus, region 4055 and 4058 are continuing to flare, so expecting that they're going to survive their far side passage too, and we'll see them again in about two weeks. Now, as far as the part of the sun that we haven't been able to see, well, we take a look at our JSOC uh, HMI helioseismology far sided viewer. Of course, the gray part here is the part that is on the uh, earth facing disk and then the yellow is the far side of the sun. So if we put it in motion, you can see several things. First of all, you can see region uh, 40, 30, 43 and 4044 surviving their far side passage. You're gonna see them turn very, very dark here as they move to the sun's far side. Plus look in this area, I think it's in this area right here. You don't see anything, do you? But watch what happens as I continue moving this. You're gonna see some interesting stuff kind of building right in here, it's a little bit of noise. But right there we go. Look at that new creature. There was nothing on the sun right there. So this is a new region that is kind of growing as uh, as it transits the far side, which means that it's going to be very, very busy. And guess what? As it begins to rotate around, this is the creature that is just beginning to show itself on the east limb. So this is when this is the one that was spitting fire just in our last segment. So this is what I'm expecting to give us a decent show. I am expecting it to be a big flare player. Don't know if it'll be an X flare player, but I'm expecting big flares to stay on the menu for you amateur radio operators and emergency responders. And then on top of that, you can see regions 4043 and 4044, part of it sticking out over here. These will be rotating back into Earth view here in about four to six days. So expect that even next week, we're gonna see big flares and possibly big solar storms for, you know, more fun on the sun. Now, taking a closer look at the set of solar storms that are on their way to Earth, we switch to our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now, this is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity. You're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. Now, as I set this solar storm model in motion, you're going to see that a single solar storm coming out. This is actually storm two and three of the triple threat we're going to get. There's actually a storm in front of this structure, believe it or not, that's not being modeled here. Now, that structure would actually slow these down a little bit, but because it's ahead, I don't think it's actually going to slow down the impact time. It's going to be, the impact's likely going to be somewhere late on the 15th, probably into the 16th. And because there's the set of three storms, we may actually be storming in through the 17th before things calm down. Now, one of the interesting things is, is if we switch to our NASA's version of the model, again, we're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. As I set this in motion, again, this is storm number two and three. So remember, there's a solar storm that's in front of this. The cool thing about it is that you may not see it here, but there's a fast wind stream right here, which means this thing is going to be pushed a bit uh, off to the west a little bit. As a matter of fact, I can switch it here so you can watch it coming around. So this is the same model run, but now we're doing it in speed, right? So now you can see that fast solar wind. That's this red region here. And look how much more red this edge is. So that's actually pushing this structure a little bit to the west, but even more importantly, that fast solar wind is actually to the south. And this structure kind of wanted to go to the south, if you remember the coronagraphs. So this is actually going to deflect, that fast solar wind is going to deflect the structure up into Earth and kind of help channel it so that it actually does end up hitting Earth completely. So I think this is going to be a pretty good impact. Even the very first storm that looked like it was going to go southward of Earth, I don't think so because of this, uh, this fast solar wind here to the south. So aurora photographers, this is going to be a great chance to be able to get some decent aurora. It's going to be kind of sporadic here and there, but it should reach mid-latitudes. And then we're going to get some trailing edge stuff. And pretty soon after that, we're going to get some fast solar wind. So the next couple of weeks is looking pretty good right now for, uh, you know, getting chances for some decent aurora. So be sure to look for clear skies. 
And now taking a look outside at our current conditions with our global geochron map, looking at radio blackouts, you amateur radio operators have been dealing with some decent uh, R1 level radio blackouts and some decent noise on the dayside radio bands easily over the last week or so, but things are finally beginning to quiet down. But you've been dealing with, you can see pops there reaching up to about 25, almost 30 megahertz. So sadly, that's been a lot of noise to deal with, but things are finally calming down just a little bit as we uh, lose region 4055 and 4058 to the sun's far side. Now, as we take a look at our ovation model, well, Aurora has been giving us some fun stuff here over the last week, but things are finally beginning to calm back down. We're kind of getting back down into the green here, and that means that Aurora is kind of retreating back to higher latitudes and really kind of dimming out a little bit. But it doesn't mean that we haven't gotten some interesting effects because of it, especially back on the 5th, we get these substorm effects. And looking at the uh, wide angle augmentation system. This, so this is precision GPS. We actually had back on the fourth and in the fifth really interesting uh, outages that just kind of were localized. So any of you frequent flyers and you uh, air crew that were flying over the Canadian provinces on the fourth and in the fifth early morning hours, you might have actually noticed some outages or some problems with your uh, reception for GPS. And that's likely going to continue when we have these bigger storms. So be on the alert for that. And now as we switch to our roti uh, map, you'll see here we've actually kind of calmed down. We had been getting a lot of this uh, potential for scintillation up at the high latitudes, but with the aurora calming down, that's getting a lot better. Now it's just kind of localized hot spots, especially on the night side, but not too, not too, too badly. We're seeing here is a couple on the day side too. And that's going to continue again uh, over the next 24 hours until that big solar storm hits. And then likely we're going to start getting a, the scintillation risk back at high latitudes for GPS and GNSS. So you drone pilots, be sure to stay vigilant. Now switching to our moon, we are now coming out of a full moon and on our way to a third quarter. And by the 20th, the moon will still be about 50% illuminated. So Unite Sky Watchers, if you want to catch the dim objects in the sky, like Aurora, you're going to have this bright companion to deal with. So you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. And now switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the hit from that triple threat of storms that are on their way to Earth. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting major to possibly severe storms. That's at a G2 to a G3 level, with up to about a 75% chance of that G3 level hitting right around the 16th. That's when things should peak. Then things should calm down a little bit by the 17th. But then by the 18th, we're going to be on a wind watch because we do have some pocket of fast solar wind that could be hitting us. After that, however, things will calm down for just a little bit, and then we'll get some fast solar wind as we move into next week as well. So a lot of good chances for your aurora photographers. At mid-latitudes, well, we're still expecting minor storm conditions, and we have up to about a 60% chance of a major storm as the storms peak on the 16th. And then things should calm down pretty quickly after that, going to maybe active conditions while we look for some pockets of fast solar wind. Might get a little bit of aurora out of that. It's kind of hard to tell. But then we may have to wait until next week, possibly around the 21st or so, before we get another big chance for uh, aurora from big solar storming. So we'll have to just see how that goes, but this should definitely give you guys some good chances to get some decent shows over the next couple days. And now switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are well into the triple digits for solar flux, and this does mean that we've got good radio propagation on Earth's day side. However, we're also sitting at the severe noise level. NOAA is giving us about a 75% chance of M-class flares at an R1 to R2 level radio blackout, and about a 10 to 15% chance of X-class flares at an R3 level radio blackout. Luckily, this is going to calm down just a little bit as region 4055 and 4058 continue to rotate to the sun's far side. But we do have those new regions that are going to be rotating into Earth view. So don't be surprised if some of this noise starts creeping back up here in about three to five days, uh, expecting the radio blackouts to continue. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders are just going to have to hang on because the noise isn't going away. Now, switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, 
Well, everything is in the green right now. We're sitting at the D1 normal range. This is for you aviators at flight level 360. It's also the S0 quiet range for everyone else. And now since region 4055 and 4058 have rotated to the sun's west limb, we do have about a 10% chance of radiation storm at an S1 to S2 level. That's going to be a risk for the next couple days until those regions rotate further to the sun's far side. Then that radiation risk should drop a bit because we don't really have any big flare players on the Earth-facing disk that look like they would give us radiation storms, at least not right now. So I'm extending that out through the five-day that could possibly change and, and become more of a risk uh, as time goes on with these new regions rotating into Earth view. We're just going to have to get a better look at them. So you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew, and you high-risk passengers, stay tuned to those ICAO advisories. But for right now, everything is in the clear. So the space weather this week has gotten very exciting. We have that triple threat of solar storms on their way to Earth. Aurora photographers at high latitudes and mid latitudes, you all could get a decent show around starting late on the 15th and possibly in through the 17th before things calm down. And now amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, sadly, we do have a lot of activity on the bands right now. We have radio uh, blackouts at the R1 level, and these are likely going to continue. Luckily, we've gotten a little bit of a reprieve from the severe noise levels as, as those big regions rotate to the sun's far side. But sadly, as one leaves, another enters. We've got a new region that's rotating into Earth view, and it looks like it's angry. So we could expect to see that noise pop back up on the bands here over the next few days. And now you GPS users, well, the news isn't so great for you either. We do have a lot of noise on the day side bands. And then on top of that, we're going to have these solar storms that are hitting that could bump us up to G2 and G3 levels for a short while. So if you're anywhere near dawn and dusk, be sure to stay vigilant. And if you're anywhere near Aurora, be aware that could affect your GPS reception as well. And be sure when once those solar storms hit, be sure to calibrate your magnetometers often. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.